Right, eh? G'day, everyone. Um, sorry, a couple of minute delay just setting up everything. Um, but today we are going to continue with design. So we've been talking about the five stage or five step design process. Um, we did on Monday, we did the first step. So define the problem. And then in yesterday's tutorial, you kind of continued on with that a little bit with the PDS for your bridge project. Um, now, as I've been saying, that PDS will be largely your first chapter or your first section for your design report. So uh, while it's fresh in your mind, I suggest your group, if you haven't already, you have a meeting today or tomorrow and you complete that uh, in the very near future because uh, it's fresh in your mind, you can work it through pretty easily uh, and at the end of today I'm going to give you the next section to start filling out and you'll be aiming to do that over the next say week, probably until the tutorial next week um, and then you'll get the third section and so forth. So you can see there's little bits that you have to fill out as we go along and then when we get to about week four, week five, uh, we have our um, academic writing lectures and so we'll talk about how to lace them all together and then you'll basically have your design report and you won't have to have a mad rush at the end of putting everything together uh, you'll just smooth it over edit it and hand it in cool um, but today what we're going to talk about is step two gather important information so uh, we talked about defining the problem and now we're going to talk about researching the problem is there a question there It is a group report. Uh, this report will be a group report. The next report will be a group report as well. You submit one report for your entire group. Um, I said a couple, to a couple of the sessions in the tutorial yesterday, this design report and this design build, your group will get the same mark assuming that your group is all present. All right. So if you've lost a group member, obviously they don't get a mark. Um, but fundamentally, if all of your group is there, you get the same mark for this one. On the next one, you will need to fill out timesheets about how much time you actually committed to the project, etc., etc., uh, and your mark will be based on that. All right, mainly because in this one, you guys are doing a lot of the work in tutorials. You should all be there, etc., etc. So you should largely have contributed the same amount of work to this project. The second project is going to be largely in your own time. We're going to give you the project. You're going to be expected to go through the same process you've gone on the first project but you do that independently as a group, okay? And so that's why we get you to fill out timesheets because that's when everything goes pear-shaped and people disappear and stop working and some people put in heaps of hours and some people put in not very much. So you guys need to manage your group time throughout that process and you will get the mark that you deserve for the amount of work you put into it, okay? Um, sweet, all right, well, so today, as I said, we're gonna talk about step two, which is basically the research phase in design. What do you reckon we need to do research in design? Yep, so we don't plagiarise anyone, so we don't copy anyone, uh, so we don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, anything else? Sorry? Yep, problems you may face in the design, so what obstacles might exist for your particular design, what else? Yeah, exactly, so it's not just that you might be reinventing the wheel, but there might have been five or six different evolutions of a design in the space that you're designing in and other people might have come across particular problems and then solved them that you might overlook if you don't do research. What else? Sorry? Beta tests. Yeah, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anything else? So there's a few different areas why we might research. It's a little bit further than just so we don't reinvent the wheel. Um, when you're in this phase, we're doing research. We can do experiments. Now, you're not doing experiments on your particular product, but you can absolutely do experiments on where the product sits or who's going to be using it. Uh, and a literature review is really, really important as well. All right. So what have people written in the past? Um, the sorts of things you might be researching, testing, experimenting, etc., could be things like the operating conditions. All right, so if we take the example of our, our can opener, how strong does that can opener need to be? 
Yeah? So how much can one person crush with one hand? Because they're going to be putting that force. And that's how much force you need to actually you know, understand. So there will be lots and lots of biomedical, biomechanical research on how strong a person can be in one hand. As, as well as, there's probably plenty of research about how much penetration force you need on a can opener. And if that information doesn't exist, you'll need to do the research. You'll need to do an experiment on it. It's got nothing to do with the design. All you're trying to work out is how strong does my design need to be. That's a research phase, not a testing phase. You haven't designed anything yet. You're just trying to understand how to design it. Um, if we're talking about our bridges, what sort of operating conditions, I mean, I've told you largely you won't need to test for the most part, um, but certainly you can do some experiments on how to actually attach to each of the tables. So I've said you can't stick to it, so obviously you're going to be sitting on top of it. What's that actually mean for your bridge? How much friction is involved in your design? Can you actually use friction? Are we going to use a smooth table or a rough table? Um, I would suggest that we're using a very smooth table, so you could put some roughness on the underside of your bridge or something like that to, to hold it there. But that's something that you could start to think about. But every single design that you do, you'll need to understand the operating conditions, and oftentimes that could be research or testing to actually work out what whatever condition it is is um, is going to be. You know, if you're building a building, you need to understand what. You know, is it likely that there's going to be cyclones? Is it likely that there's going to be earthquakes? That kind of stuff, right? When we're doing literature review, you're looking up journal papers, but you're also looking up patents, because patents will stop you getting sued if you're designing a product. Uh, books, plenty of books around. Uh, codes of practice um, and AS or ISO standards. So everyone know what an AS or an ISO standard is? All right, so AS standard is an Australian standard. Um, the Australian government has signed off on many thousands of standards for everything from welds to shafts to electronic components to how you do a technical drawing. There are thousands and thousands of Australian standards. Um, and ISO is the international version of that. So there's many, many, many more international standards. Some of those Australians come and said, all right, we want to you know, customise that for the Australian sort of legal uh, atmosphere or the Australian conditions or whatever. So ISO and AS standards, uh, you can get both of them or one of them for particular areas. So you've got to do a search of those because they'll tell you how to design and what sort of things your design needs to actually adhere for, to in terms of safety. Um, and existing products at market, obviously. Um, if you're designing something, you want to understand what other people have designed in the past. Where might you find journal papers? Does anyone know? Where? Okay, library. Yeah, yeah. So we've got we've got lots of journal papers in the library. They're largely reducing the amount over there. Yeah. So there's web pages and things like that we might use. Anyone else? So I'll talk a little bit about where you find papers. What about patents? Has anyone ever found a patent before? Patent office? Yeah, well, that's going to be an interesting, interesting conversation at the patent office. That's where they are, but everything's online, guys. Absolutely everything's online. Uh, and if you're on the JCU website, then you have access to tens of thousands of journals that JCU pays for. Um, and the same thing with patents. Um, if you're off campus, if you use the virtual private network, the VPN, Basically, JCU thinks you're on campus, and anything you have access to on a JCU computer, you have access to at home if you're VPNed into the JCU network. All right? So that's a major advantage to doing that, because then you just look up Google and the papers will download for you. Let me just open. I've put on Learn JCU this PDF. Some useful websites. So we're talking about the second section here. Let me just zoom in a little bit. Alright, so obviously when you're searching something, most people will go straight to Google, yeah? Pretty easy, or Bing, or something like that. Uh, I like Google because Google has some extra little features. Google Scholar, has anyone heard of that? Yeah, most of you? So, if you're looking for a journal paper, 
Google Scholar is your starting point. And in the tutorial next week, um, we'll have Andrew Stacey from the library come and talk to you about some more options for finding papers and books and things like that and how the, how the library services work for research. Uh, but fundamentally, Google Scholar is a starting point. And if you're on campus, if you're on JCU, or if you're VPN'd in, then all of the journals that JCU has paid for, you'll be able to download the PDF right there and then. You won't have to go through the library website and all of that kind of stuff. You can just click on them, and if you're on campus, it'll actually download. All right, so Google Scholar is a really good resource. Um, I would use it 10 times a day, probably, just in my job. Um, Google Pattern Search, this one here. You can basically go straight to Google and it will allow you to do a pattern search, uh, except I'm not on the internet here, obviously. Um, it will allow you to do a pattern search out of the box. So if you look up a product like Can Opener in Google Pattern Search, it will restrict all of your results to any patents that exist for a can opener. Okay? And so right there and then you can, patents are like a nightmare to actually interpret, but you can work out roughly what people have done in the past. And then if you really need, you go and get patent lawyers to start interpreting what you're proposing and what they've done and so forth. Um, Google Cheat Sheet. Now let's see if I can plug in because this is useful. Oh no. That worked, sort of. Okay, so Google Cheat Sheet uh, is a whole list of different cheats for Google, funnily enough. All right, you guys may know a lot of these, um, may not. Obviously, most people will know quotes, yeah? So if you put actual quotes around your search, it will come up with that exact phrase rather than just any combination of those words. That's very useful. Most of you should be across that. Um, things like the minus I find very, very useful, right? So basically if you do a search and you get the first five pages of being something that uses that word but slightly different, you can put the minus, add the minus and that word to your search and it will remove all of those results from your search. So if I look up tanks, and I'm wanting water tanks, not military tanks. And I get a whole bunch of pictures of military tanks in Google Images, then I can put minus military or minus army or something like that. It'll remove a lot of those from the search. Now that's a pretty silly, you know, you'd say water tank or something like that. But that's just an example of where you can start using these cheats to actually refine your search. Because Google skills are one of the best skills you can have very early on. The ability to search and find the information you need very quickly is something that you probably most of you are across um, because you've been interacting with Google for 20 years but these skills start to really come home when you've got really detailed design work to do. Um, another thing, Google keywords or keywords for your search. A lot of the time you don't actually know what you're searching for in terms of exact words that's when things like Wikipedia and Google Images come into it. All right? You do a, a dumb search with the phrases that you think are close that aren't actually close at all, and then you scroll through Google Images and go, yes, that's what I'm looking for, click on it, then it will actually give you the real words or descriptors for what you're actually talking about. Use those words in a new search, and then you'll actually get a lot further of the way there. All right? Wikipedia is good as well. Wikipedia information is sometimes garbage, although it's not too bad these days. Uh, but Wikipedia's best function is for keywords. Chances are, even if the information in Wikipedia is garbage, the keywords they use, the descriptors they use for a particular idea, uh, will be very accurate. And you'll be able to use that in a Google, you know, Google Scholar search or a Google image search or whatever and actually get the results you need. So, um, there's some other cheats and, cheats and things there. I suggest you read some of these and, and start to use these if you don't use them already. All right, um, Google Images, I've talked about, you know, a couple of times already. Google Images is probably my favourite part of Google. And the reason is, is that you can scroll through a set of images really, really, really quickly. Okay? So if I did a Google, a regular Google search, let's do a regular Google search on bridges.
All right, so let's do a regular Google search on uh, first year engineering bridge competition. Right? Okay, directly to project, spaghetti bridge, project. All right, so forgetting about the fact that the images are there in the center, I'll scroll through there and I don't really know whether any of that's really useful to me and I can probably spend a day just going through all the Google pages, clicking on things, trying to work out what's useful. If I take that exact same thing and put it in Google Images, that's what I get. Yeah? And so now, instead of having to click on a page and see whether it's even remotely relevant to me, I can scroll through this and see hundreds of designs of first year engineering bridges that are examples of what I might be trying to do in my project. And if there's one you really like, that's when you can like click on it and then follow it through to the website and see what they did and see what sort of structures and all of that kind of stuff. All right? Google Images is a brilliant tool because we are visual people, most of us, and we scroll through visual images very quickly and we scroll through text very slowly. And also, if you look at how many results per page there are in an image search, it's many, many more than are per page in a regular web search. Yeah? So for most of what I do, I'll at least look at a Google image search first just to see if there's anything that I think might be appropriate. And then you dig down deeper and you use it for keywords or you use it to find websites or whatever. So Google images is going to be very useful for you guys, particularly in this first project. Let's have a look at centrifugal pumps because that's what you're going to do in your second project. Who knows what a centrifugal pump is? Some of you? Who knows how one works? Less of you? Good. You'll know very well by the end of the year, uh, semester. All right, Google image search. Many, many pictures of pumps, and lots of pictures with arrows that explain the way things go and so forth. So obviously you're going to be finding textbooks and all sorts of papers and I'm going to be explaining how they work and all sorts of stuff for the centrifugal pumps. Google image, really good starting point as well to, you know, what is an impeller? What is the housing? Which direction does the impeller go in? All of that kind of stuff. So it's not just for finding cute pictures of cats. It is a really useful scientific resource as well. Cool? All right, what else have I got here? Um, YouTube's always very good if you're trying to, if I want to know how a centrifugal pump works, I might look at a Google image, but probably I'll just YouTube it and say, how does a centrifugal pump work? and YouTube will give me a video, a nice little diagram and all sorts of things and you can follow it through. Very, very easy. Um, Wikipedia, as I said, is mostly useful. It, it's, it's much more useful these days than it was in the first early days of Wikipedia because they got lots of moderators. But for the most part, it's good to get you about sort of 25 to 50% of the way there in terms of information. Um, and then you can dig down into their references and keywords and so forth. Uh, TED Talks. TED Talks can be useful if it's a particular area that's applicable. Um, look for books on Amazon and Google Book. And then once you find the book, because those resources are very good, then you can go to the JCU library website and see whether they actually have that book. Or you might be able to find a free version of it somewhere. Or if you really need it, you can buy it somewhere. Um, but those search engines are very powerful. I use a thesaurus a lot also, particularly when I'm writing. We'll talk a little bit about technical writing, but oftentimes there's a word that I'm trying to use that will replace three or four words, and if I can't think of it, then I can normally come up with a dumb word that doesn't fit that means the same thing, and then back it out of a thesaurus. Okay? And if you're doing a Google keyword search as well, if you're trying to find the right keyword for what you're trying to explain, a thesaurus can help out in that circumstance as well. Okay? So these are very useful tools. The other stuff that I have in this PDF is up the top here and many, many universities, not just MIT, offer all of their lecture notes for free online. But MIT, and here we have, if I clicked on mechanical engineering because I'm a mechanical engineer, this goes to the front page of every single course in mechanical engineering that MIT has offered in the last four or five years. And if I was to scroll down here, there they are. All right, pages and pages and pages. And if I was to click on one, let's say uh, engineering dynamics. I click on that. Oh, no, not that link. Hang on. You 
You're proving me wrong, computer. All right, not that one, apparently. Oh, view course. There we go. That's what I'm doing wrong. All right. Course home, syllabus, video lectures, readings, MATLAB sessions, assignments, exams. All of the course content is there. Okay? So in terms of what we were talking about, about studying the other day, I'm talking about try and find alternate sources of the information in your study session because just watching the same lectures again might not be as useful as watching someone else's lecture on the same topic. Every single MIT course and every single branch of engineering that we study, as well as maths and physics, so if you're having an issue with algebra, they'll have an entire maths course on algebra, including lecture notes that you can follow through. Okay, so this is a brilliant resource that you can use, and it's in the PDF that I've put on today's lecture in LearnJCU for every discipline and maths and physics, and you guys can search out the Harvard equivalents and the Princeton equivalents and all the rest of it, because they all offer free stuff as well. Okay, but I thought I'd highlight that because it's very important that you guys understand what's out there to allow you to actually find extra information that you might not get or, you know, that might help you out in a different way than what you're getting from your lecturers. Alright, so that was a bit of a, a departure, but it was all around online sourcing of information and that's what you're going to be doing in this phase of the design project. You're going to be finding as much information on these bridges as possible and I'm going to give you a template with all of the information you need to find uh, at the end of this lecture. The importance and the potential benefits of the research, are, some of them are here. So the first one, what has and hasn't worked before, so we talked a little bit about that. What's missing or needed, so if you're coming up with a new product, it's no good just producing the same thing that everyone else has produced in the past. What haven't they done or covered that you might be able to distinguish your company or product by? Um, you will accelerate the development and have a useful starting point because you don't want to reinvent the wheel, you don't want to spend six months just trying to come up with something that has already been designed and works perfectly well somewhere else. So you are going to accelerate that design process by seeing at least a starting point. And I'm not saying steal someone else's stuff, I'm saying if you understand how it's designed everywhere else, then you can understand how it's designed in your own product. So if you're designing a car, you don't reinvent the wheel and which side do we put the steering wheel on and do we have pedals or do we have hand controls and does the brake go on the left or the right? And, you know, you don't have to redesign all of those things. You know full well where those things go in your car. It's a much more uh, refined area for change if you're designing that. Uh, benchmarks and data for analysis and testing. This is an important one, right? So when I get to about step four, we're going to be talking about analysing your product. And it's no good analysing your product if you don't know what the actual forces and conditions on your product or design or, you know, massive machine in a mine. If you don't know what that loading actually is, then you don't know what to test. And that loading is found in the research phase. All right? So you need to find all of that information right at this front, front, front phase. Um, what analysis procedure might you apply? So there will be plenty of people that have analysed similar things to what you're doing. How do you analyse a bridge? If you're in third year civil engineering, you're doing structural engineering, there'll be plenty of textbooks on how to analyse a bridge. You don't need to work out from scratch how do I put forces on it and then how do I calculate the stress and things. There's a procedure for that and that procedure you should highlight in the research phase of the reporting and the project. All right, market potential, is anyone actually going to buy the thing? Competitors, who's around? And you avoid legal hot water by making sure no one has a patent or a trademark or a, you know, whatever. Including on the name, if you've come up with a snappy name for your product and then you've done a search and found out someone else is selling the same thing, you're going to get sued. So, um, you'll need to find a different name. So, be careful of that. Cool, so that's some of the uh, reasons for doing research um, and now I'll talk about this quickly and then we'll talk about our bridge and then you can have an exercise for about 10 minutes and then we'll be done, okay? So, um, the example that I gave of a water supply and that water supply can be anything from a straw that you drink dr dirty water with to, you know, pumps and tanks and filters and things like that. Let's say we have a dirty river that's much like Ross River. Would anyone be willing to drink Ross River? No, probably not. She's pretty dirty most of the time. Um, village of 100 people, 
small and easily constructed water supply. Uh, it needs to be durable and less than $5,000. Alright? Where should we start our research? What sort of research do we need to do on this? How dirty is dirty? How dirty is dirty? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good one. Yeah, so I don't have any idea how much water 100 people need. And do they take showers in that water or is it just for cooking and drinking or what? Yeah. What kind of contaminants are in the water? What contaminants? Yeah, absolutely. So we need to do some testing of the water to work out what type of filter, what type of filtration system we'd need. Does it, uh, and I can put some YouTube videos up on filtration, but there's three different areas of filtration. So it's no good just boiling it because then you might have chemicals and dirt and grit and all the rest of it and a bunch of other things. So you need different filtration for different types of contaminants. Yeah, so how far do you actually have to uh, move the water once it's been filtered to actually get to the people and, and that kind of thing? Yeah? Um, over here, anyone? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, so what sort of organisms live in the water? Um, both in terms of little bugs that you need to kill and in terms of fish and other animals that you need to perhaps not kill. Um, that's all very important. Anything else? Yeah, yeah, so what's going to be involved? I suppose that's largely how much water's involved. So if you only need a little, little bucket of it, then maybe a hand pump would do. But if you're doing really large amounts, really large volumes, then you probably want something mechanised, and so that's very interesting as well. And you have to power as well. Yeah, power, that's right. And what power is available? Can you plug in there, or does it need to be solar powered or whatever? Yeah, for sure. Anything else? Probably legal stuff. You might want to look up some standards and... Things that we talked about last lecture about, you know, the country and that sort of thing. Yeah, good one. So what are the conditions in the country? Uh, are there cyclones? Are there monsoonal rains that are likely to flood, basically take a river from here to, you know, raging torrent and back down again each year? What sort of conditions is this going to have to survive in? Yeah, what are they doing currently? What about what is everyone else doing currently? Yeah? Obviously, lots of people are getting fresh water. Um, what is every country with dirty water or every developing country or developing village with dirty water in their rivers, how do they drink currently? What other types of filtration methods are around? Is there something that you can buy for $100 that saves you designing something that costs $5,000. Because if there is, it's probably not worth your time. And you can say that to a client. If they come to you and say, all right, we've got $5,000 to make this water supply, and you find someone that sells a $20 straw that does the exact job that they're wanting, $20 straw, point them to it, all right? You don't need to design something just because someone's asked you to design something. Sometimes you can go back to a client and say, look, it's not financially feasible to do what you're suggesting when it's already been done incredibly well. Maybe what we do is supply these to the country and act as a, as a middle person. So there's lots of different options that that research will sort of uncover. All right, now, closer to home and closer to what you actually need to do, what might you need to know in terms of the bridge project? What sort of research? How high is the table of the table? High is the table of the table? Yep. So um, the table itself is going to be a standard type of lecture table, unless I build a box, but I don't think I'm going to build a box. Um, basically, I need enough room to hang the weights under it, and that's it. Okay. So in terms of that, Height of table, um, the main implication there will be your 50 mil sag. You can build down below the line of the table if you want. I don't mind that so long as, let's put a limit on it of 250 mils. All right? You can go 250 mils below the line of the table. So 250 millimetres below this line. So, for example, if you wanted to do something like this, you know, that kind of thing in your structure or whatever, this distance here, you can go down, is that 250 mils? 
25 centimetres? Yeah, so about that far, if you have to. Uh, but I don't advise it, it's probably not the best design. But, so that's, that's the range that you're going to live in. What else might you need to know about the bridge? The gap you're spanning, yep, so I've told you that. The span is one metre. What else? Something that you need to get from research. Yeah, thank you. Structure. All right, structural options. Obviously there are structural options. You're going for the lightest bridge possible, so you're not just going to put a heap of material there. What you're actually going to do is try and optimise your structure. It seems silly to start from scratch, so doing some research on that will be very useful. Anyone else? Design ideas? Yeah, so design ideas kind of comes under that, but in terms of, so your structural options is your broader picture, and then design ideas might be examples of other people doing in the past, like the website that I showed before. and maybe inspiration. All right, what else? Materials. materials. What might we need to know about materials? Structural yeah, so structural integrity, probably the weight. So how much does a particular material weigh? And the strength and the weight to strength ratio for a particular material is going to be critical to your design because steel is very very strong but it's also very very heavy and balsa wood might get you most of the way there and it's very light All right, so that relationship between strength and weight is something that you'll need to investigate for all of the options that you're thinking about in terms of building materials Yep. Load distribution. So, if I'm loading this at an eyelet at the centre, that is a very point load, which is very bad for a bridge. And so you need a structure that allows that singularity, that point load, to be then evenly distributed through the structure and then through the piers. All right. So when we're actually looking at bridge types, you need to be thinking about, and what we're actually going to do right now, funnily enough, is exactly that. Look at structural options and think about load paths. Um, anything else that anyone can think of? Yep. Cost. All right, so you guys are self-funding this. I'm quite happy for you to spend $10 on a bridge. Um, People get enthusiastic and spend lots of money on these projects if they care about them, but for the most part, I'm happy for you to make this out of rolled up paper. And you should be able to get a ream of paper and some sticky tape and glue and make that strong enough to carry about 15 kilos. Fundamentally, if you get your structure right, that will be very, very light. Last year, we did tank stands and they had to make it out of paper and the only fixing they could use was sticky tape. And again, we were optimising weight and the group that won the competition for lightest tank stand, it was 30 centimetres, so it had to be 30 centimetres off the ground. They held a bucket that was 20 kilos of water, and their tank stand was 46 grams. And that was paper and sticky tape and nothing else. Okay? So you can do this very, very cheaply with a very good material like paper. Or you can use balsa wood, which might cost a bit more. Um, you can get more complicated than that, but I'm not asking you to. That's up to you. But when you're looking about these materials and strength to weight ratios, and what I've got in the document that you have to fill out, it's strength, weight, and cost. Because then you need to balance strength, weight, and cost and decide which one you're going to actually test with. Because, you know, carbon fibre is a brilliant material. It's also incredibly costly. All right? I don't expect you guys to make a carbon fibre bridge. All right? Anything else? So, um, along the lines of load distribution, what sort of eyelet might you actually use? Are you going to build your own or are you going to buy the $2 one from Bunnings that I put a link for? And then, if you're bolting on, what does the actual structure where you're bolting to look like? Do you just have a little platform between two bars and bolt on that? Because that's probably just going to tear itself out because all of that weight's going through that one point. 
So it's not about having a strong bridge and then a really weak eyelet. The eyelet is the game. The bridge's entire function is to hold that eyelet up. And so how does the structure and how do you actually incorporate that into the design? Okay, so that might be the last one. <coughs> Certainly that you care about. So, where might we look for this information? All right, where are you going to find information about tables? I just told you. Span, I just told you. Structural options. Google. Google Images. Pretty quick place to start. Design ideas, you can probably start with Google Images and then see if there's any documentations or reports or anything that some of those university students might have uploaded. Um, materials. Bunnings, yeah, so you can work out what your material options are at Bunnings. Material strengths and things you're still going to want to do a Google search on. Um, maybe find papers, maybe find material suppliers will tell you what the strength is for ply and steel and aluminium and all the rest of it as well. And what the density of things are. Wikipedia is always very good for density of things. Alright, so there's various areas there. Uh, load distribution, you're going to have to think a little bit about the way load works and maybe do some you know, experiments or at least uh, think about what free body diagrams actually are. Has anyone heard of free body diagram yet? No, you guys haven't done that yet, but that's alright. Um, we'll talk a little bit about it when we talk about experiments. So, there's various places you can look for this information. Textbooks are always good as well. Alright, so we've got an exercise for about, oh, let's say, 10 minutes. Um, get your devices out. Uh, work in groups of two or three or whatever. If you don't have a device, look on and, and look on the next person's device. Um, these are the six categories of bridge. All right. And so what you're going to do is maybe do a Google image search on each of those and just do a quick sketch. So I want a quick sketch of each of those six types of bridges because this will be your starting point for your research for your actual uh, bridge project. So, go to bridge, trash bridge, arch bridge, cantilever bridge, cable stay and suspension. Alright, spend 10 minutes doing that and we'll have a chat. Alright, so hopefully everyone's got at least a couple of pictures. You guys would have gone through a Google image search. You see that Google Images is pretty quick and easy to use. Obviously everyone's familiar with that. Um, <coughs> is just one type of diagram that I found. If you went straight to the names, you would have got a name each. If you went to bridge types in Google Images, you'd have gotten images like this. Um, effectively, the most important thing from your design standpoint is how does the weight translate from a central load to the banks? All right, Because you can't attach to the banks. And if you look at a lot of these designs, the way that the force actually translates assumes that you can attach to the bank. So, for example, suspension bridge over here on the far right. If you put a load here, that loads up this big cable which bends this pier over to the right and you attach that pier back down to the ground with another cable and so the force basically ends up being restricted here on the road. On the, on the actual bank of wherever you're at. All right, so a suspension bridge is not particularly appropriate for the problem that you're addressing because you can't attach to that bank. Okay? And that's where the load path goes. So what I want you to do over the next couple of days is start thinking about the load path for each of these particular types of bridges and whether that's an appropriate format for your particular bridge. All right? Um, cool. And last thing I'll talk about before we're done is, let me just find it, is the actual research brief. So the research brief is kind of the chapter where you summarise all of this information, where you write it all down and that's what's going to be in your design report. And online on today's lecture, and it will also be in the Project One folder in a second, um, I've put this brief here. And this brief is basically the template that you fill out. It will tell you what information to put in each section. You maintain those section headings. You put your names on it and so forth, and then this will be your last, um, uh, your second section in your report. So the purpose, I want four to five sentences. 
then this section is review of any potential bridge structures. So that's at the very least the six that I just told you. All right? And you're going to talk about the type of bridge. Give me an image or a drawing. Discuss how a central load is carried by the bridge, as in where does the load go? And then discuss on the pros and cons within the context of this design project. Okay? So you can basically take what you've done and then just flesh it out a little bit. The next section is on review of potential material for the bridge, and that's the stuff I was talking about, strength to weight, cost, how available is it, that kind of stuff. And there's some dot points there you can follow. Review of comparable first year engineering bridges. Do a search online as other people that have designed bridges. This isn't a new thing and I haven't invented it. There'll be hundreds of thousands of bridges that first years have designed in the past. Uh, have a look at those and see which ones you like the best. Uh, and then weight attachment options, islets, and how do people actually put them in a bridge, okay? So, this has the information you need to fill out, just a couple of sentences on each one, and you're done with that section, okay? So, over the next week, you want to finish your PDS, and you want to get most of the way towards finishing this in your group. So, there's lots to go on with. Cool? All right, thanks, guys.